Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Raquel from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work, and this week, I'm joined by production designer Lawrence Bennett, whose work includes The Artist, Panic, and more recently, the series The Offer, which explores the making of The Godfather. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Now, uh, I was going through your your bio, and I, I'm really interested that you went to university in Tokyo uh, mm-hmm. for a while. What, what did you study there? I studied um, language. Oh, yeah. Most- most generally, and uh, religion and history. Oh, interesting. And how does that play into your your work as a production designer? I feel like that would, like, especially history of, and religion and all that stuff would really impact it. You know, I was, I've always been really drawn to um, the simplest of the Japanese aesthetics. Yeah. Um, and really drawn to the architecture and, and, and craft. Um, the beauty of, of very simple, beautifully made things is, still has just huge appeal. What is um, it about it? That... What is it about it? Yeah. I think largely that it's grounded in nature. You know, there, there are two aesthetics in Japanese culture. One they inherited from the Chinese, which is gilt and, and vermilion and scarlet, and, you know, mm-hmm. a little on the very overly decorated side. And um, the other is, is more Shinto based which is just based in more, um, I think more drawn from, from nature. Interesting. So did you also like get into gardens and everything and study, cause they have, you know, such a history in gardening as well. Tremendous, tremendous gardens. Yeah. Was there, um, you also went into Ireland and, and worked there for 10 years. What was, what were you doing there? Um, what was I doing there? I was, you know, I painted, I was a painter at the time and showed my work and um, worked in French theater at a design practice with an architect friend. We did architecture and, and I got into French theater, worked at the Project Art Center, which was you know, the alternate theater in, in, in Dublin at the time. And um, generally just immersed myself in, in making art. So how did you make that transition to production designer? Um, at a certain point, it would have been sometime uh, late eight, late seventies. I came to Los Angeles, went to Los Angeles for a summer, and worked with some friends who were doing um, miniature work for Cosmos. Mm-hmm. And I was on the miniature team, and, and we got a tech at me, and it seemed very like an auspicious sign. And um, talking to people and looking around, I realized that my love of film and theater and graphics and photography all sort of combined into um, an affinity for art direction. Now you you worked on The Artist which is sort of a film based on in the silent era yeah. and I'm wondering uh, how did you go about recreating the look for the the silent era? Um, you know I'd always been really interested in, in film from that time. There's something about the purity of, of just the, the pure visual storytelling in the early days of cinema. And I was quite taken by, I've always been taken by the, uh, the fact that at that time, the people who were making film were inventing film language and also inventing the film business. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd always like, you know, obviously of my Chaplin and, and Keaton's work. A friend of mine in college, uh, his fa- his grandfather was Raleigh Tothrow, who was okay. Chaplin's cinematographer. So um, one night I remember at a party there, we watched some of his grandfather's personal prints. Oh, wow. Projected on a sheet on the other side of the canyon. This was in Laurel Canyon back in 69, something like that. Um, and that's a truly magical, magical sort of moment. Um, so when, when I took that project on um, and put a team together, we just did, we watched a tremendous amount of film. Um, 
together as, as, group, as a group and also individually. Everybody in the department was assigned things to watch. And the drawing room where we had three set designers and a graphic designer and art department assistant working, we had a monitor and something was always playing, a film was always playing at the time. And I really encouraged everybody in the team to do their own research. So in terms of um, photography of the sets and um, history of where stuff had been shot and how they let everybody dig in for themselves. And we all did collectively a lot of research. Interesting. Did you, because I know some directors and depending on the, the role, some people like to hide little Easter eggs because you're you're so, uh, you like the that era so much. Did you guys leave little references to other films or little things in there for us to see? Nothing small. There is a uh, set in the artist <clears throat> when when Pepe is on the rise and she's the the new star in town. Mm -hmm. um, she's on set with with uh, John Goodman's character, the producer, and the set that she was filming in. Uh, I based on a very famous um, set from Our Modern Maidens. Okay, and uh, it was a, a set that was so popular at MGM that it got repurposed for several different films. It's a really distinctive, very, very um, high concept deco piece. Mm -hmm. So I um, did a version of that. That's 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 larger than Meg. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, now, you also, you're, you're currently working on, or you worked on the, um, the offer. Mm -hmm. So how did you get involved with that, that project? Um, just one of my agents called with, you know, saying that they were interested in talking to me about it. And to be honest, at first I was very skeptical because, <clears throat> you know, being a lifelong fan of, of, of Francis's and, and you know, admiring the picture so much, part of me just was very resistant to messing with it, you know, mm -hmm. to do anything in or around it. Um, but I'd read over the years and heard so many stories about the, um, the craziness that went on trying to get the picture made. Um, you know, war stories in our business are a big deal. Yeah. Um, and they were so funny and so improbable and so unlikely that I finally relented and, and you know, said I'd talk with them. And they sent me a couple of scripts. Um, and I found it very funny and very human. I, I really thought that they went out of their way to give some dimensionality to to all the characters even small characters mm -hmm. and um, you know, everyone had very genuine authentic high-minded reasons for doing what they were doing in their competitiveness against one another yeah and it was just um i thought it was a hoot i just found it terribly funny so um said yes and got stuck into it now how did you go about because like you said it's it's a very important film in cinema history how did you go about recreating the sets for the, the the series and you know making sure that they were correct i don't i don't know how much of this series you've seen if any um the sets from the, the from the movie are very few yeah. they, they take a very little screen time in the course of the series uh, most of it um the prep and, mm -hmm. and all the things leading up to filming. Um, for the films, for the sets themselves from the movie, because no drawings uh, existed, yeah. the studio of, of, of the sets and locations, we basically just did it uh, you know, frame by frame forensic analysis. Oh, wow. We did find um, online, one of my art directors discovered a scan of one of the sheets of the drawings of the Corleone house interior, which was built there in, in uh, at Filmways in East Harlem. And so it was not super high res, but we were able to, to discern just a, a couple of numbers and, and figure out the overall scale. And you know, that was the, the beginning of the drawings for that set. So because during the Don's, the Don's dead, obviously, I mean, that is the single most iconic 
uh, setting for any of the scene work in the picture and, and getting that we felt obviously a tremendous responsibility. Now, like you said, it's um, a lot of it doesn't take place on the sets, but it's taking place in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, so how did you go about recreating that look in that era? Um, it's, it's tough. Everything was done in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. it was, um, we needed to either pick New York or Los Angeles to do the entire project. Um, and in Los Angeles, we had Paramount Studios you know, because it's their project and one of their uh, pieces of legacy material. So knowing that a lot of the stuff would happen at the studio, decided to do it in LA. Um, it was also cheaper. Um, but doing period New York, doing New York and Los Angeles is very daunting. Yeah. Whether it's interiors or exteriors. And there are no <clears throat> hotel rooms or suites that will pass for elegant high-end Tony New York hotels. Yeah. I've worked a lot in New York and, and <clears throat> you know, just, I, I, I really missed, <clears throat> excuse me, I missed the wealth of things that would have been available to me there. But, um, so we built a lot on stage. Um, we used Paramount, Warner Brothers, and Universal's backlots really extensively and found little pieces of downtown Los Angeles where we could do a block's worth of New York exterior. Wow. Um, it was all um, painstaking. It was all very carefully sort of orchestrated. So how, because like when I think about New York, there's that mixture of uh, architecture from like the, the 30s, the 20s, the Art Deco movement. Yeah. Um, and when I think about Los Angeles, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> so was there, was there a lot of adding to the building, the space that you found, or was there a lot of set extensions that you guys had to, to do? We used set extensions for many of the exteriors, both on backlot and downtown. Um, had a really great VFX supervisor, and he and I developed a great working relationship. He was with us through almost all of prep, through every day of filming. And he and I kept in touch right through editorial. Um, he was sending me comps to look at um, when the show was on the air. You know, yeah. The last couple episodes were just being finalized. So well, how do you like to work with, with the VFX team then? Because that's something that's, I guess, new in the last 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Um, so on, this, on, the, on the offer, I found like we really found a great way of working. Um, uh, I made sure that John Manja was the VFX supervisor. He had done um, Queen's Gambit, yeah. which is where he got my attention because I thought it was really nice lyrical sort of work and you know mm -hmm. didn't didn't get way of anything um, and complimented the, the foregrounded material. So I made sure he had an office in the art department. And he and, and the VFX producer were based there. Um, so we talked virtually every day, scouted together. You know, um, he had him input into what he felt he could bring to each of, each of our uh, crises. Mm -hmm. And you know, we carefully picked and chose what angles to feature for set extension, some of which were very big. Yeah. Um, uh, for example, the scene where um, Michael and Kay are Christmas shopping. Yeah. Before Michael finds out that his father's been 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 shot, uh, be outside Best and Co, the department store, that was done at Backlot Universal, and we rebuilt the the lower probably sixteen feet of a block of of New York streets there, and everything else other than the street and that half half story all the effects. Uh, those poor actors having to wear <laughs> do uh, winter in LA. Um, yeah. So, what would you say was one of the more challenging scenes for you in the in the series, and and how did you overcome that challenge? I think I think in general all of the New York exteriors, mm -hmm. because we could limit the view, but we didn't want them to feel like we were just looking into buildings so that we couldn't see down the street. Um, Sal Totino, who was the, the DP, who uh, I started with, he, he really felt it was important that we show the canyons of New York to whatever extent mm -hmm. possible. 
So even in the very first shot in the picture, which was done paramount backlot at the Festival of San Gennaro, um, we built these huge steel um, trusses that go over the street that carry the decorative lights for the festival. And we did half a dozen, eight of them to, to do two blocks worth. And then VFX was gonna take it from there. But we also did a gigantic blue covering the building at the end of the street so we could put in the, the, uh, the all of the architecture that's, that's up Mulberry Street. Because mm. you can actually see um, you know, some pretty tall built Empire State is up there. Yeah. Now, is there a particular, um, you know, like when I talk to um, cinematographers or I talk to uh, directors, I'm always interested if um, about the working relationship. So, how do you get on the same page as a as a director in in a project? Um, much the way a DP does. Um, you know, a lot of it obviously comes from the page, but this being a period based thing, you know, I just sort of went back and immersed myself in everything late 60s, early 70s about New York, about the coast, and, and just a lot of stuff about American culture and current events at the time. Um, because this was one of my two COVID projects, mm -hmm. we were in the height of all this. Dexter Fletcher, who was the first director, was stuck in London. After he was hired, he you know took ages before uh, he could get a visa, mm -hmm. partly because they had a different batch of uh, va uh, vaccinations there. So uh, in the time while that was being sorted, which was several weeks, he and I would chat like three times a week on Zoom, yeah. and had these long, involved, really very funny conversations. Um, and they'd be prefaced by me sending him a whole batch of images to look at. Mm -hmm. So I would call just a whole bunch of stuff. It was just like color photography from New York in the late 60s. And send it to him and we'd talk about that. And the next day it would be a whole batch of black and white photography from New York in the, in the 60s and 70s. Then the, the same process with LA. Then looking at specific buildings and then things relating to certain scenes in, in, the, in the series as much as we knew about the first, the first block. Yeah. So that was it, it was just kind of immersing ourselves in, in how things felt. It's like phone booths were a big, a big thing. I mean, the, last, the last phone booths had just been taken down in New York City. And um, they used to litter the streets. Yeah. There were gangs of them, six and seven, six and seven long in the financial district. Uh -huh. um, you know, so making sure that they were a, a, a visual focus and, you know, yeah. something that the ADs could work on background action. Now, you, you mentioned that you also, you were studying the era, area, you were studying the time and, and also like the political situation or the, the news yeah. of the day. How does that factor into the production design? Like, how do you use that? In this instance, really gently. Yeah. Um, I think rather than look at the politics that was going on, they're buried in the background with a couple of anti-war posters on the walls. Okay. But is we're really talking about 67 to 72, but felt it was more important to foreground the, the political struggles between New York business, the LA studio and New York organized crime. Okay. That was enough politics really to, to to, to burden ourselves with. But then when Joe Colombo um, is part of founding the uh, Italian American Civil Rights League, yeah. and he has his rallies in, in Columbus Circle, you know, that's, that was a, a key political thing at the time because he leaned largely in sort of the, the hard hat, you know, basically right wing movement in New York yeah. at the time. Now I have one last question for you. Um, you know, we've been stuck in this pandemic. You obviously did two pandemic jobs during that time, but some people, depending on where you are in the world, you might be inside quarantining, you might be allowed out. Uh, is there a show or a movie you've discovered on streaming set networks that you think people should check out? Absolutely. Um, that was the offer by way, the way was the only one of only, was okay. only one of two projects I did during the pandemic. Previously I'd done a, a small picture called Dog. Um, working during the pandemic is, is really tough. Uh, fortunately, some places like 
California decided that filmmakers are essential workers. Yeah. So as long as we kept to the industry agreed protocols, we were kept relatively safe and could keep working. Um, the surprises for me in the past season, um, Reservation Dogs, I'm a oh, big, yeah. Yeah. big proponent of that. It's just one of the freshest things in television in ages. And I just finished watching something that an English uh, director friend of mine had recommended. I just caught up with uh, with landscapers. Yeah. Both of them, just great, offbeat, game-changing kind of series. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. My pleasure. And that's it for this week. Make sure to check us out on filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.